Uh, the first thing I want to do is to congratulate Martin on this, this play, uh, Gently Down the Stream, which is a, a new work. Uh, is this your uh, very newest play? Next newest. Next newest. He just keeps writing them all the time. He won't stop. But uh, Gently Down the Stream premiered last year at the Public Theater in New York with uh, Harvey Fierstein uh, playing the lead role. Uh, and uh, why don't you, it's, uh, uh, generally down the stream is a love story. Uh, um, and I'm gonna let Martin describe it to you. But uh, he's, he's said in other interviews and as we just talked earlier that this is a play that he's been intending to write for many years and I want to explore why that is. Can you tell us about, about uh, the characters in Gently Down the Stream and why, how they uh, fulfilled uh, a need you had to write uh, this play? Um, yeah, I've, I'm so bad at describing my own work. It's about, um, it's about different generations of gay men. It's about an older generation that uh, believes he's not allowed, uh, th that they're not allowed to love, and the younger generation who have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. And it's a clash between those generations. I wanted to write, I wanted to write a play for many, many years about uh, the changes that had occurred in gay life over the last 40 or 50 years. But I didn't know how to do it. I tried it. I tried it in many, many ways. I tried it as an epic. I tried it as, I don't know. I, did, I just took notes and started different versions, and none of them worked. And um, one day, I, was, I live in London, and I was crossing the street. <laughs> and a little idea fell in my head about a play ab about uh, what I just said, a, a generation of older men with a generation of younger men. I, that's not how I had been thinking of it before. And I was able to write it. Mm -hmm. it. It came like that and I was able, I was able to write it and I wrote it very quickly. I, but this was after... I, this was after about 16 years. Of My, thinking about it. Of, of and trying, and yeah. yeah. The very first, I have on my computer a file which comes from the very first computer I ever had, which is gently down the stream. <laughs> gently down the stream. And I've had that file. And that, that all, comes from merrily, all the merrily, time. merrily, merrily, merrily. Yeah. Life is but a dream. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Um, the characters in the play are Bo, uh, a, a 61-year-old. Uh, he starts out as 61. Start out, uh, starts out as, as 61. He's a, a piano player uh, from New Orleans. And it's uh, very funny, uh, when, when Martin was interviewed last year uh, by Rob Wiener Kent, my successor at American Theatre Magazine, he, uh, he asked Martin if he knew me because I'm a... A, a gay piano player from New Orleans who, who, uh, who, left, who left town and uh, stayed away for many years. And he was saying, uh, uh, who, who did you model this after? Not Jim O'Quinn. And I, I, I guess I'm not uh, a model. In fact, you don't model your characters after anybody, you say, right? No. 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 But there are, there are lots of figments of people that are, mm -hmm. you know, enter into it. But... They're not based on any well, one person. Uh, and I, I had actually, um, I had spent a lot of time in New Orleans in my 20s. Uh, and then I, and I, I loved the city passionately, and then I never came back. And the first time I came back was for the Tennessee Williams Festival, which was about, I, I was here four or five years ago. And uh, it had been the First time I had been here in well, something like 40 years. And shortly after that, 
the idea came of how to write the play. And I realized that I could go back to New Orleans in my writing and use it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because I have great debt to the festival. If I hadn't come back, yeah. I wouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's great. I think the subject of uh, generations is, is a profound one and something that I've thought a lot about, too. Um, I think you're probably somewhere like 10 years older than me, maybe. And then I'm married to a man who's 10 years younger than me. And he and I often talk about uh, the difference in our, our upbringing and, the, and our uh, responses to the world around us, just in that 10 year difference, you know? And uh, the characters in your play have, what, a 30 year difference or something mm. like that. Mm. And, uh, and what, what uh, talk a little bit about what they discover. Uh, what the dynamic is between them. Ooh, that's... Is that hard? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> well, I know... You tell me. I, I know that the, uh, the, young, the young guy who's named Rufus, he's a, he's a lawyer and uh, a, a guy with problems of his own, but he's eager to uh, hook up with, uh, with Bo. He, he's, a, he's a, you know, he wants a match. He wants a, pair, a pairing. And uh, Bo, Bo is uh, much more skeptical. Of, of that. Well, both both thinks that everything ends will always end badly in a relationship, and he has very, very, very real reasons for thinking that, and his reasons are entwined with the history of gay life over the last sixty years, and it includes um, a lover who died of AIDS. And it includes a lover who died here in New Orleans in a fire in a bar. That's, uh, uh, that's I, I was uh, saving the mention of the upstairs yeah. bar for a little later because it's such a downer. But uh, were you here at that time? Where were no, you? No, that, that was after my time in New after Orleans. After your time in New Orleans. Yeah. I was here. I was yeah. working for the public school system when that awful thing happened and I remember on the next day the next day I I went to work and somebody made a joke a, a terrible joke about roasted weenies or something just and I, I was I went home <laughs> I couldn't stay it yeah, that was a joke that was made over the radio I think yeah, also well, that yeah. Maybe he yeah. Yeah. just yeah. unbelievable but you see it was, it was very interesting when we did the play uh, it, it was really interesting discovering how young gay men know nothing about, and it, they certainly don't know about the upstairs lounge, but that's because very little has been written about it. But even the knowledge of AIDS is minuscule. And so many people would come up to us afterwards and say, well, we didn't know any of this. And, um, well, let me, let me say this, that in the play, uh, Rufus is very interested in Bo's uh, history and his mm. experiences, and he gets him to sit down, and, and uh, Bo has these long monologues in which he tells uh, the story of gay life at, at, uh, through his own experience. Uh, beautiful, beautiful speeches. Uh, so anyway, I'll go ahead. So uh, it's, it's, it's really an important... Um, issue to be addressed, which is history and uh, passing on stories. Um, there's another play. I shouldn't <laughs> talk about someone else's play. But there's another play that's in London right now, in previews, written by a young American writer called Matthew Lopez called The Inheritance, seven and a half hours long. Uh, two, two parts. And it deals with all of these issues. And it's uh, a young, youngish man writing about all of, all of this. And it's a stunning, stunning, brilliant play. Wow. Well, I noticed that, uh, I mean, this might, this might be the gayest season in New York uh, ever. I mean, there are so many uh, our friend uh, 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 Moises Kaufman is directing Torch Song Trilogy. Uh, mm -hmm. 
on Broadway, and uh, uh, there's well, there's a, a, a Boys in the Band is opening. Uh, and Angels in America. Angels in America is coming from London. It's uh, a tremendous time for gay theater. Why is that, do you think? I think quite possibly uh, because now that gay men and women are able to be open, um, there are people in positions of power who are who want who want to see things who want to see things done. They've gotten to those positions not by doing gay work necessarily, but now they want to see th things being done. So you, you have somebody like Ryan Murphy producing Boys in the Band, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. well, something's in the air. Something is definitely in the air. Yeah. Um, You grew up in uh, New Jersey, mm. but you <laughs> skedaddled to London as soon as, <laughs> in 1980, as soon as Bent was a success. Yeah. What, uh, for many of us who have considered in the age of Trump maybe abandoning the United States, I'm, I'm curious as to why you, you did so, uh, so long ago. Well, I can only give you the dullest answer. It's nothing dramatic. I just, uh, the first time I ever went to Europe was in my 20s when you do that trip. Uh, and I went to London. I was not an Anglophile. And I was there for about 20 minutes. And my instinct just said, okay, this is where I'm going to live. Sometimes just, you just know, right? You just know. <laughs> It was just instinct, and it was one of the times in my life in which I followed my instinct, which one should always do, but often one doesn't. And well, you, I don't you also fell in with it. some awfully interesting people in London, the gay sweatshop. Uh, but that was after. That was after I. Was I, uh, already made I only decision. I only fell in with the gay sweatshop because I wanted to live in London, mm -hmm. and started to do things to make that happen. Yeah. Well, uh, a, a lot of people may uh, not know about what the Gay Sweatshop is or have forgotten about it. Uh, uh, tell them what kind of company that was and why you were attracted uh, to working with them. The Gay Sweatshop was founded in 1975, I think. And it was a group of artists in London who were tired of the depiction of gay men, uh, I would say gay men and lesbians, but there was no depiction of lesbians in, uh, in the theater in those days. There was huge invisibility about lesbians, and gay men in the theater were always suicidal or um, figures of some kind of, some kind of fun. And they wanted to, they, want, they wanted to redress that, and uh, they were a group of very good artists, uh, actors and directors. And the idea of an openly gay company was totally shocking in those days. And they're, they're, they, they wanted to create, help create a theater that would make them no longer necessary. And, that, and that's exactly what happened. Um, it was disbanded about 10 or 15 years ago. There was no need for it. Mm -hmm. um, and in the first season, they, I, I read about them, and I, I, I had an agent in London, and I asked her, this, I, I'd written a play called Passing By, which is just a romance between two guys, which in its day was fairly shocking because nobody, because the fact that they were gay was not, had nothing to do with anything. It was not, um, it was not a problem. It was, uh, therefore it was radical. <laughs> uh, out of its innocence, it was, it was radical. And it had been 
produced by the brand new Playwrights Horizons in New York, uh, which then was just starting, and it was awful. It was just the worst production, and it was mortifying. And then there was a gay company in New York called Tassos, and they produced it, and that was even worse. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was really about to give up. And then the gay sweat shop asked to do it, and I went over to see it, and it was directed by the one of the founders of the gay sweat shop, who was a visionary named Drew Griffiths. It's a two character play. One of the characters was played by a young actor called Simon Callow. And uh, it was the first good production I've ever had. And it was life changing. And I became very close to a lot of the members of the sweatshop. And I just worked with them. And I started the next summer, I came over and there was, I watched a rehearsal of a play they were doing. Uh, which is a very sort of darker drama. And they, they, it's very interesting what happened to them. They caused a stir in the first year. Uh, and, and they did a number of plays, and they were really interesting plays. And so immediately, the Arts Council, which funds uh, artistic endeavors in England, uh, approved the grant to them, because it's the only way you can survive, particularly then, would be with money coming from the Arts Council, which is from the government. Uh, so they got their grant, which meant that they could continue and they could live. But the grant insisted that their plays be in some way educational, so they could take them throughout the country and would have social value from that point of view, which meant that as time went on, the plays became less good because they, they had to fulfill that function. Uh, so I saw a rehearsal of one of these plays, uh, and there was a mention in it, one sentence about... Um, gay men having to wear pink triangles in Germany. And I immediately thought, oh my God, I, I have to write a play about this, because nothing was known about it. So I started writing Bent for the gay sweatshop. Right. And I, I, I would never have written it if it hadn't been for them. Well, now that we're... And then, yeah. and then when I wrote it, I sent it to Drew Griffiths uh, for the Gay Watch after Produce. <laughs> and he said, we, we can't do this. He said, we can't do this. You have, to, you have to give it to somebody bigger than we are and more well-known than we are because it has to go out into the world. We, 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 we can't do this. It was the most generous act that anyone has ever performed for me. That's amazing. Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. <laughs> he was right. Yeah. Because uh, Bent was an enormous success. I saw it uh, many years ago with Richard Gere on Broadway. Uh, Richard did as well. And um, it was, it was life-changing. It was a life-changing play. Uh, how, and and it was a it was your first big wow. Oh success. yeah, I was a I was a total failure until then. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't did, get I couldn't get arrested. Well, how did <laughs> how did all that success affect you personally? I mean, did you? Um, well, you know, you, it's one of those. I think life is constantly about mixed blessings, good and bad to everything. Now you sit there and we look back upon it as this enormous success. And when it happened, well, 
it was produced first in England, and that was wonderful. And then it went to Broadway, and and um, we had very strange neurotic producers. They never made us feel that we were dealing with a success. We were unnerved constantly by them. We didn't know what business was going to be like from week to week. The subject matter was so shocking to be on Broadway that a lot of the people in positions of power didn't know what to make of me. Um, and I think they thought it was kind of a fluke. And so I never had the kind of um, adulation or publicity that, that, that Harvey had later or, or mm -hmm. Tony Kushner. It was, um, so a, yes, a it was like a, a one shot. Yeah, uh, so, so I, which in, in some ways is very good because I, everything was proportionate. Uh, at, at the same time, it was amazing if you, if you looked at all of my life earlier, which was pretty dim and dismal, it was, it was great. It was great. And it allowed me to move to London. Um, yeah. It gave me the... Uh, it allowed me to financially move to London because it's very difficult. You don't just move to another country. You have to be able to support yourself. Do you feel uh, like it put you in a new uh, realm of artistic associates and oh, yeah. professional possibilities? Oh, it yeah. It, it, uh, completely. Completely. Mm -hmm. In terms of artistic collaborators, it, it changed my life. Totally. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, the film of Bent, that came, what, 15 years later, did you say? More. It was about 16 or 17 years 16 later. 16 or yeah. 17 years later. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, uh, uh, you told me a little bit about that. Uh, you insisted that uh, you picked the director. Yeah, we tried to make it. When <laughs> Richard Gere was doing it on Broadway, we tried to make a film. And Fassbinder was going to direct it at one point. Uh, and, you know, he was a great, great artist and an incredible creep. And, um, oh, no. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not a secret. And he tried to blackmail us, so to get Richard to be in another one of his films. Uh, that all yeah. just didn't happen. And then Costa Gavras was going to direct it, and that fell through. So a lot of years passed, and after a lot of time, a, a young producer came to me and said he wanted to make a film of it. And by that time, I thought, mm, it's a hard one to turn into a film. It's real, because I had written several films by then, and I knew. A, a, I think a plays. I think a, I think a good play is the most difficult thing to turn into a good film, because a play by nature, even if it's an epic, a play by nature is claustrophobic. It's what creates a certain tension on the stage and between the stage and the audience, and a film is the opposite of that. And and then if you try to open things out, it can be false and you're squeezing and it's, it's uncomfortable. It's really difficult. Uh, and it's, and also most film directors are not good at capturing that kind of claustrophobia. So th there's a discomfort. Um, Sidney Lumet was great at capturing that. Uh, and Mike Nichols when he directed Virginia Woolf, but that, mm -hmm. it, that's rare. Right. That's rare. So I was very nervous about it, and, and, and I said, well, if I'd consider it if you had Sean Mathias direct it. Sean directed the first revival of Bent in London, which was 10 years after the original production uh, at the National Theatre, and was a great friend of mine, and I knew 
Yes. We could do it together. And the producer to my shock said yes. So I was stuck. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, what we, a cast you had. Clive Owen, uh, Mick Jagger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Frank. If you haven't seen the, the, that film that did result, uh, check it out. It's well, we had, we, we had uh, a budget of about $10. And it doesn't it was, look like it. It, it was, looks expensive. Well, here was the thing, and I, I, I said to Sean, look, there's a great problem in filming this, because the first act is like an old-fashioned film. It goes scene to scene to scene to scene in Germany, and it, 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 it has a sense of an old film. This, and then there's an interval, which is one of the greatest um, tools a playwright has, and playwrights don't often use it because you can change everything with an interval. And when the audience comes back, you can be in an entirely different kind of mood and place, uh, which is something you can't do in film. So in Bent, after the interval, you return to something that is slightly surreal and just a little bit abstract and doesn't have the same kind of reality that the first act has. And I said, I, I don't know how we can do that on film. I don't know how you can change, I don't know how that second part can work, uh, how you can change that kind of mood. And Sean said, well, maybe the secret <coughs> is to make the first half as abstracted and surreal as the second. And then it will be of one. And knowing that, and knowing that we had the five dollars to make the film, we shot the entire film in disused factories. That's what that place was. And every, every scene is filmed in an unused factory uh, and so it, it gave this sort of strange, Germanic, surreal feel to the, to the entire film. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it worked like crazy. And Mick Jagger is lowered from the ceiling and dragged. Must not miss it. And of course that, you know, that was so easy. Sean said, well, who would you like to play Greta? And I said, well, when I wrote it, I was thinking of people like Mick Jagger and Rod Stewart, people who were straight, who used gay mannerisms in their act, to, um, which made them stars. So he said, well, let's ask Mick Jagger. And uh, he phoned his agent. Mick Jagger came the next night to see, Sean had directed A Little Night Music at the National Theater, came the next night to see it, and said yes the next morning. Beautiful. That's beautiful. What a great story. <laughs> well, uh, well, this is the Tennessee Williams Festival, so let's mm. talk about your relationship to Tennessee Williams. Yeah. I found in the, in, I don't know where, in some of the writing about you that, uh, that uh, growing up in Camden, New Jersey, you said, you told my friend Matt Wolf, the critic Matt Wolf, that I was the only kid in junior high school to have seen Camino Real. Uh, oh. So you were, you were tuned into Tennessee Williams in junior high school. At least, yeah. I started going to the theater when I was six. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. And, um, and I lived across the river from Philadelphia. So plays used to come there on their way to Broadway. And very often, and I would go to Saturday matinees, and it did occur to me that very often I would be the only child sitting in uh, a very adult theater watching a very adult play. <laughs> so I saw the original productions uh, in Philadelphia of Camino Real, of um, Canon on a Hutton Roof. Uh, uh, and I was in a class, a mathematics class, 
in junior high school, and one of the students showed the teacher the Spanish book, for studying Spanish, and it was called something like um, El Camino Real. And this girl said, oh, there's a play. My mother said there's a play in Philadelphia called this, and the teacher just turned pale and said, you must not go <laughs> under any circumstances to see that play, and you must tell your mother, you must not go. Well, I had you. seen it the Saturday before. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. And I can remember every production I saw up until the time I left home, which was, I was 17, and I went to college in Boston. I can remember them absolutely clearly. I can't remember anything I saw last week or five years ago or 10 years ago, but I remember everything I saw as a child, yeah. including you, that production. How old were you when you adapted um, The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone, uh, Tennessee Williams' oh, yeah, it was novella much, into a play? Much, much. Well, I, I, no, I adapted it into a film. You didn't do, I thought you had done a play yeah. of it first. No, no, no. No, you just went to the I, I, I adapted it into a film, um, which was, when would that have been? That would have been uh, 203 or 4 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it was made for Showtime with um, Helen Mirren and Anne Bancroft. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. And then the director asked me, to turn it into a play, because it's all very bizarre. He was, he was a, well, he had directed Bent on Broadway, and he directed a, lot, a number of films. Uh, but he also had his own little company in Tokyo. Don't ask. And he asked me to do an adaptation, to, to turn the, the screenplay into a play for the company in Tokyo, which I, I was very wary of because I thought if Tennessee Williams wanted to make it into a play, he would have. And I finally, because he was a friend and he had directed a lot of things, he directed a lot of my plays in the West End as well, so I said yes. Uh, but with the condition that it would only be in Tokyo and, and no place else. And he did it in Tokyo and I went to see it. And it really worked on the stage. Mm. So I said, okay, we can so do has this. has it been done elsewhere? No, um, it's, it, it's being talked about as a Western production now. Oh, but you talk is cheap, so I don't know. Yeah. Might be, should be. Right, right. right well, uh, you guys join in and help us. Uh, do you, uh, what questions do you have for Martin here? Uh, Yes. Well, okay. Speak really loud. How, how do you know work belongs on stage, not in a story, not an essay? Do things come to you and you see them as theater? Yeah, I think if you're a natural playwright, it does. I mean, I, I first of all, I couldn't write a book. I, I, I have no aptitude for it whatsoever. I could not for instance, describe this room, or any of you. I couldn't, I just couldn't do that. Um, that's not my aptitude, but I could write a play that took place in this room. <laughs> um, so, the thing, ideas come naturally to me as a play, the problem is that they don't come that often. <laughs> and um, so in between that, I am able to write films, which is, which, which, which is a very good thing. Now, for a lot of writers who are exclusively screenwriters, ideas come to them purely as film. Um, it has to do with your artistic genes are. <laughs> what do you think of when you're creating a character? What do you see the, the things you draw and when you're building on it? 
It's, 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 it's difficult to answer that only because it's so natural to me that I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what it is that you do. Um, it, very often the, uh, ideas come in with a character first and you it's just a question of well first of all it's a question of knowing everything about the character that you're writing even if most of that doesn't enter into the play. Uh, once you, you think of a character in a situation, you've got to know them, and you've got to know their history, and you have to know what they want. In a, you, 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 you have to approach a character as a writer the way actors approach acting a character. You have to know what they want and what they need in each scene and what they so it isn't just who they are but what what dramatically they require in a scene just as an actor has has to know what the want is for for each scene then if you know enough about a character and you're starting to write uh and you're able to let your subconscious unfurl, uh, then the character will tell you stuff that you never imagined, and the character will just lead you. So many playwrights, you, so many playwrights say that, that yeah. the character spoke to me. Yeah. Well, it just, it just leads you places you never imagined, and the character wants things that you didn't realize, but you have to be, you have to do the work to get to that place for that to happen. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think for actors too, the um, uh, night before last, I believe, May Hayes was saying there was a Women of uh, Williams program and she talked <laughs> about when she played Blanche that the director Jason Kirk Kirkpatrick spent a whole evening with her going through the story of her young husband's suicide. Mm. And she, she spent, uh, they spent, uh, you know, let's talk about that evening, how it happened, what you did, da 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 delving deeply into it. She spent a whole evening with the director going through that so that when she did the scenes uh, about that in the play, that backstory informed her performance, and that's sort of the thing you're talking about. You have to know all about the character. Oh, absolutely. You, 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 have, mm -hmm. you, have, you have to know everything. And then when you know everything, you discover that you don't. Um, mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm interested about the Romans from the Mrs. Uh, to me, it's one of my favorite pieces, but it's also one of my favorite because it's sort of a multi-question. Why did you choose it? Is the character of Mrs. Stone somewhat, uh, uh, you know, a version of uh, Tennessee Williams? Do you see it that way? Did you change the play, the, the screenplay, in any way? I'm just curious what you did with it. Why did you choose it? Well, I didn't choose it. I was asked to do it. Okay. Uh, um, I don't think that Mrs. Stone is a version of Tennessee Williams, other than the fact that every one he wrote is a version of Tennessee Williams. There is a huge, pro it's a wonderful book, but there are huge problems of logic in it. And one of the problem, which manifests itself in the first film that was made, is that Mrs. Stone doesn't seem to be an actress. She seems to be a society woman, uh, and I have no idea who he based it on in terms of the reality of the actors that he, he worked with. And it's interesting, in the biographies of Tennessee Williams, there's never a clue as to who really he was thinking about when he, when he wrote Mrs. Stone. So one of the things I did in the screenplay was to really make her a person of the theater. And uh, there's a character in the book and in the original film 
of uh, an old friend of hers who's a gossip columnist, and it's a person she can confide to. And it's, and she's an absolutely horrible, horrible woman, this character. And because you also have the Contessa, who is uh, an extremely difficult person, I, I thought, no, that can almost, that can almost turn it in, into a slightly misogynistic uh, Those way. Those three women are... There are too many. Too many it's, women it's, with it's, problems. Uh, well, <laughs> too, too much unpleasantness. And so I got rid of her and turned her into Tennessee Williams and made that character playwright that made him Tennessee Williams. Wow. And therefore, because uh, she needed to confide to somebody, but also brought her more into the theater and made her a, a person of the theater. The other thing that's missing in the book, which is very strange, is the war. The book was written after the war. It's mentioned a little bit, uh, but rarely, tu rarely touched on. And it takes place in Rome, in a country that's been ravaged by war. It explains the behavior, really, of the Contessa and of the young man, but it's not, it's not there. Uh, he has one or two lines about having been uh, a, a pilot in the war. Uh, so I brought the. I brought the war into the screenplay, the awareness of the war, which I thought was very important. And you know, he wouldn't have done that in a play. If he had written it as a play, he would have been aware that those things were missing and he would have, he would have solved them. Uh, Well, she wasn't a socialite. She, she, um, she wasn't at all socialite. She was an actress. But in the film, she appears to be a socialite more than an actress. There's a, it's, and that's, that's the problem, I think, in past versions with, with, with that character. But Vivian Lee was totally of the theater. Yeah. 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 Right there? Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Mrs. Henderson and Tennis. Um, <laughs> how did that end up uh, a film rather than a play? I know that's sort of the question you already answered, but. It's the same thing with, with, with one or two exceptions of every film that I've written, I was asked to do it. <laughs> uh, no, I would, um, uh, a producer had somehow come upon information about the um, Windmill Theater <clears throat> and asked me to write it. And in that case, there were givens before I wrote it. The, the Gibbons were Judy Dench and Bob Hoskins. So I wrote it for them. <laughs> That'll do it. Questions? Yes. Uh, plays are largely the same as when you wrote them, but in a lot of ways they're different than stage. <clears throat> what are you noticing is changing in the way playwrights Well, I think I think playwrights are, are moving have moved away from the old proscenium-centered 
um, box kind of play. <clears throat> and, um, but I, and there was increasing freedom of subject matter and, and but actually they, they move, they've moved more towards theater of many centuries ago to an Elizabethan theater where you could go from scene to scene, you can change scenes like that. It's, nothing takes place in one set. It's seemingly epic, but um, so, you know, nothing is really new. It's just the theater had become more constrained, and now it's opened up again to what it once was. Or even postmodernism has something to do with that. Yeah. It takes it. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Um, what else did you enjoy reading as a child? Hmm? What did you enjoy reading as a child? Ooh. Uh, I read everything I'd get my hands on. I j I'd. Uh, <clears throat> So, I don't know how to answer that, because I read so much. I read so much, probably a lot that was inappropriate. I re uh, then, when I was uh, in my very early 20s, I had the most life-changing reading experience, uh, which has influenced me completely in, in every way. Uh, and that was the Alexander Quartet, Lawrence Starrow. <laughs> yes. How do you differentiate that sort of neutral language of a monologue play with the exposition in a film? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, first of all, the difference between writing a film and writing a play is that, and the great thing about being able to go back and forth between the two of them, is that when you write a film, you think, oh, thank God, I don't have to talk. <laughs> and when you write a play, you think, oh, thank God, I can talk. <laughs> and, so it is a totally different language. It is a totally different language, and you can't blah, blah, blah in a film. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Oh, that's interesting. And he also reread. He used to tell me about mining his books again and again and again. Do you reread? Reread? The same books. Oh. I'm just going to put this on because I'm getting a little cold. Uh, no, I don't reread the same books. I've, I've read the Alexander Quartet several times, but <laughs> aside, aside from that, I don't. And I'm surprised what you said about his, yeah. Because to me, the beautiful thing about being a playwright, which is very, makes it very different than other kinds of writing, is you have the periods of writing the play in which you have to be absolutely isolated and completely by yourself and alone and and then you have the periods of doing the play, which is totally social and completely communal. And I honestly be, believe you have to love both. Uh, 
I, and, and both of those need to be a part of you. I think you're going to suffer a lot if you, emotionally, if, if when you're actually in production, you need to be a part and Oh, oh well, that's different. That's different. But but the, the the actual production of the play is extremely social, and you have to like that. I think. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. More. <clears throat> uh, do you have any? Um, I wanted to ask you if you think, because uh, you've talked so much about gay theater entering the mainstream, do you think there's a need anymore for gay theater companies, for culturally specific comp uh, companies that... No, I don't think there's a need for gay theater companies, but I think there's a need for gay writers to write out of their experience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the play I just saw in London, The Inheritance, is just the most beautiful piece of new writing I've seen in years and years and years. Can't wait. And it's totally out of gay experience. Mm -hmm. Very much so. That's great. All right. Uh, I keep hearing the issue about gay actors playing gay artists. Mm -hmm. Is that an issue that you really know? Well, if, if only gay actors can play gay parts, then only straight actors can base straight parts, uh, which limits the life of a gay actor enormously. Um, so no, I, I, I just don't. I just don't think that's true. It's called acting. Yes. Okay. Other questions. About the vo well, um, I'm I'm in a much easier position because I live in England. <laughs> um, if I lived here, I'd be so concerned about so many things that I I <laughs> I wouldn't know where to begin to deeply, deeply worry. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, frightening government very often allows for the best art to be produced because of the tension there and the rebellion there. Uh, so, we may be in for an incredible artistic surge. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I wouldn't be so. Think of Eastern Europe and Polish and Hungarian work, and things like that. Mm -hmm. not to mention Russia. <laughs> so, all right. I think uh, let's give Mr. Sherman a hand.